Okay, we expect, speaking of which, <laughs> we expect to have a, a change, an attitude. We expect that Ishmael will react with a type of resentment. Okay, we expect that Ishmael may react with a type of anger, hostility, jealousy, etc. And so it's the parent's responsibility to make sure that on that first child, love is communicated, acceptance is communicated. Hopefully other people in the Bible learn that lesson. Hopefully Jacob learns that lesson. Hopefully I, Israel, when he gets his name changed to Israel and he has 12 kids and one of them's younger, hopefully he doesn't treat that younger one with special attention like with a technicolor dream coat. Hopefully they learn how not to favor one child over another. I don't, I don't think they're going to learn that lesson. And sometimes in blended families, parents are unfortunately placed into a position where they must choose between one child over another. And it's unfortunate. In the sin-twisted world, parents are put into a position sometimes where they have to choose between one child and another. And here, Abraham's in that position where Sarah comes to him and says, there is something that is happening. Sarah said to Abraham, verse 10, drive out this slave with her son. Doesn't even name either one. Notice that. Drive out this slave. In modern American redneck hillbilly terms, it would be take that girlfriend of yours and your offspring and kick them out of here. Okay, is that type of an attitude here. So take this, drive out this slave with her son, for the son of this slave will not be a co-heir with my son Isaac. He will not grow up with him. He will not share an inheritance with him. He, he is violent. He is horrible. I don't like him. He is causing problems. Get him out of here. He doesn't deserve any benefits of the family. Cut him off from the inheritance. Verse 11, now this was a very difficult thing for Abraham, you think? You think Abraham loved Ishmael? Absolutely. Absolutely. We, we can't forget this, that Abraham loved Ishmael, and now he's torn between his first son and his special son that's a gift from God. Now he's torn. What do I do? Do I drive out the son that I love? What do I do with this? So God comes and talks to Abraham. And God said to Abraham, Do not be concerned about the boy and your slave. Whatever Sarah says to you, listen to her. <laughs> okay. Think about that for a moment. Sarah says, Drive them out of here. Kick them into the wilderness. Send them to the desert even. is, is where they end up going. Kick them out. And then God says, Eh, okay, go ahead and do that. Okay, I'm reading this. I take a double take at that. I'm like, what? What? The God I know is a God of compassion, a God of love. Yes, he's a God of justice and wrath and, and, and judgment. But he's also a God of mercy and grace. They all are God. So I look at this and I go, what? And I have to stop and say, no, God's good. I start there. So somehow this was a good action that God says this is appropriate. And so people wonder, why did God do this? Some people think because of Ishmael's sin, because of how he was acting, that this was a punishment. Drive them out. This is a punishment for, for Ishmael acting so improperly. In which you know, is possible. Ishmael was indeed, if, if we're right about the persecution and the violence here, Ishmael was indeed sinning. And it was Ishmael's fault. Okay, no parent forces a child like that to sin. Each person's responsible. Parents play an influence. But ultimately, the children are responsible for their sins. Parents are held accountable by God for how they treat their children. So the parents are will one day be judged for that. But still, the child is responsible for their sinful behavior. So parents, when your child acts sinful, it is appropriate to look at them and say, what you're doing is sin, it's wrong, you're acting disobedient, you're acting disrespectful, this isn't what God wants for you to behave, this isn't the attitude He wants in our family. What do you think would be more God-honoring? What would please God more? And allow the child to say, if I did this instead, okay, then let's do that, because that's what would please God. 
and, and show them in Scripture if you have to, where that is. That should be the, the attitude there, okay? And here, God's like, yeah, go ahead and drive them out. And it's like, really? Drive them out? Well, here's what's going on. It's not punishment on sin, I don't think. I don't think that's what it is. Though I do agree, sin should be punished. Parents should correct the children, and some punishments have long consequences. I, I don't think it's a punishment issue. Anybody remember, if, you were, if you're familiar with the text, if, you've not, if you're just joining in, this will be new for you. Before, Hagar left the group. He left the home. Okay, Sarah was, was mean to her because she was pregnant, and, and, and Sarah wasn't, so Sarah was kind of mean to Hagar, so she left, and God interceded that moment. God showed up to her on her way possibly back to Egypt, and God tells Hagar, I hear you. I see your suffering. Go back there. I will take care of you, and your child will become a great nation. Okay? Your child will become a great nation. That was God's promise to Hagar about Ishmael, that your child will be a great nation. Now, he'll be a donkey of a man. This is what he's going to be like, just letting you know, FYI. In other words, he's going to be stubborn. Uh, he might kick if you get behind him. <laughs> okay, and he's, he's going to be a handful. And we see the donkey type attitude here. So, you know, we find that Ishmael and Eddie Murphy have something in common. Uh, Shrek reference. <laughs> Come on. It's all right. <laughs> and so it, that's what God said. He's going to be a donkey of a man. He's going to be a handful. He's going to be stubborn. He's going to be a little bit of a kicker. Uh, but he's going to be a great nation. That's what he's going to be. Now, if Ishmael stays part of the family and becomes a great nation, people will look at Ishmael and say he is a great nation because of Abraham. That would be the likely connection there. Look at Hollywood today. If someone's a great Oscar-winning actor or actress and their child gets into acting, people are going to have expectations that they're going to have the same genes as their mom or dad. And so what a lot of child stars like to do is they want their first movie to be not with their parent because they want to make it on their own. And so this is a little similar thing. God wants people to look at Ishmael and recognize that the blessings of Ishmael came not because of partial inheritance of Abraham, not because of Abraham's great wealth, not because of Abraham's great estate, but because God gave it to him. Ishmael will be a great nation because of God. And then God already has set the prediction out that they are going to be a violent nation. So later, Ishmael's people, all his family, ends up becoming the Muslim basic community. Uh, it's Middle Eastern conflict, all about, about Iraq against Israel, is about this Ishmael-Isaac conflict that's here. That explains right there a lot of the Middle East turmoil that's going on, of this giant family feud that is happening in the Middle East. And so, uh, so guys, that's that whole donkey attitude that's going on there. And so, so God tells Abraham, go ahead and send him out. I will also make a nation of the slave's son because he is your offspring. So God tells Abraham, just because he's your child, and I told you that everyone you're associated with will be blessed, your child will be blessed and be a great nation for that reason alone, because I'm a God of my word. And so he says, send him out. I'm going to make him a great nation. Don't worry. Early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and a water skin, put them on Hagar's shoulders, and sent her and the boy away. You see the detail on that? You think Abraham's probably crying at this moment? He's grabbing the water skin, he's giving it to them, and he's saddling them up, and he runs his hand over the back of his son's head for the last time. And he says goodbye. And off they go. Probably never to really see them like that again different than sending a child away to college. Okay, this is goodbye. So Abraham sends them away. So Hagar left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. This is where Hagar has her conflict and her struggle here. The story shifts a little bit to this little section. So they're wandering in the wilderness of Beersheba, verse 15. When the water and the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down nearby about a bow shot away, for she said, I cannot bear to watch the boy die. So she, ate near, so she sat nearby and she wept loudly. Here's what's going on here. They're in the wilderness. The water dries up. Ishmael likely gets dehydrated first. 
Okay, so maybe Hagar is a, a beefy woman, and so she has more of a reserve she could reply from. Who knows what's going on there? Uh, but she apparently has a little more strength than Ishmael does. And so Ishmael has a problem, so she picks him up, and she can't bear to see him die. So she places him inside of a shade where he won't get all burnt, crispy, crittered, and puts him under some type of a, br- of a brush, and then goes off about a bow shot away. Likely because she, he's probably crying and groaning in pain. So she goes far enough away that she can't hear. So she goes off. I can't bear to watch him die. I can't bear to hear this. I, I'm just going to leave him here. And I'm going to walk way over there and just sit and wait. Okay, this is a rough, rough part. where what, She completely forgets. What did God promise her? That he would be a nation. How is he going to be a nation if he's dead? Okay? He, God told her directly, this is what's going to happen. And she knows God's the God of his word because she watched Sarah get pregnant. At the age of 90, barren, and this is all you know, this post-flood time point. People before the flood were having children much later than Abraham and Sarah, but the norm now is not that at all. This is much later. And so she saw a 90-year-old woman get pregnant. And she saw God fulfill his promise. She was there when the three visitors showed up, God and two angels, and talked with Abraham. And they had dinner together. And they told them, you're going to have a child. She was present. She was part of that household. She was there. She knows that God is a God of his word. And she has this problem, and she buries her head in the sand. That's what she does. She buries her head in the sand. And often, when, we're, we're just like Hagar sometimes, aren't we? Don't you ever have it where you run into an obstacle, you feel like giving up? When you feel like this is what I need to do in life, and I just can't take it anymore? And you say, line, anybody ever say that line, I can't take this anymore? Anybody ever say that line, am I alone on this? Okay? Have you ever had it like a child screaming, and you say, I can't take this anymore? Or bills keep piling up, and you say, I can't take this anymore? Or problems and things around the house keep breaking, and you say, I can't take this anymore? And then, you send, and then sometimes as a result, you act in self-destructive ways. You don't do proper stewardship. You don't go in and you quit studying the Bible. You quit praying. You quit going to church. You quit surrounding yourself with the body of Christ that might be there to help you. You, you quit completely the resource that could give you the strength. Because Jesus says that he is the strength that is perfect. And in him we can do all things. The phrase, I can't do this anymore, is a wrong phrase. You can still do this. You're just running out of patience, but you can still do this. Every time that thought pops in your head, I can't stand this. I can't take this. I can't do this anymore. Stop right there and say, through Christ, all things are possible. Through him, his strength is perfect, and I can still carry on. Okay, and that's what Hagar is not doing. She's not praying. She's not turning to God. God has to come to her and shake her a little bit and say, listen up, woman. Okay, but we want to bury our heads in the sand and say, oh, woe is me and oh, pity me. And sometimes people will even act in completely self-destructive behaviors, even more so than not going to church and not praying and not reading their Bible. Sometimes they'll go and they'll get drunk. Sometimes they'll go and get high. Sometimes they'll go and turn to sexuality. They'll be able to find some old boyfriend or some old girlfriend and just roll in the sack together as a way of trying to avoid the pain that they're in. Or they'll shut everything down in their life and they'll say, I don't want to go outside. I want to stay indoors. I want to play Facebook. I want to be on a game. I want to see how high of a level I can get because all I care about is my game and all the things of God are uninteresting. All the things of Scripture are uninteresting and I don't even find them relevant anymore. In fact, I'm going to get angry if you mention the name of God. And that's how people can end on this cycle that just totally wipes them out. And they destroy their life simply because they won't call upon Christ. Because they'd rather turn into themselves. They'd rather just spiral into to woe is me type thinking and self-destructive behaviors. That's what Hagar is doing here. She would rather let her son die than to beseech God. Seeing that, that's what Hagar is doing. We're not that different. 
We're, I, I, it's my fear. We're not that different. Verse 17, God heard the voice of the boy. Isn't it nice to know that even when you're abandoned, even by your parents, God still hears. It's ironic because the name Ishmael means God hears. Even the name of the boy is a reminder that God hears in times of suffering. So God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What are you doing? Okay, it says, What's wrong, Hagar? <laughs> Basically means, What are you doing? Why are you so upset? Don't be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy from the place where he is. Yeah, not where you are and should be, Mom. Okay, that's the inference there. Get up. Help the boy up. Get over there. Be a mom. I can't stand to hear him cry anymore. Yes, you can. I'll give you the strength to hear it a moment longer. Get up and get there. Help the boy up. Support him. Be a mom to him. For I will make him a great nation. He's reminding her, I gave you that promise several chapters ago. Didn't you read Genesis? <laughs> they didn't have the book yet. But I gave you this promise. I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes. This is a moment to where it's not that God suddenly created something out of nothing. Is that suddenly she just looked and went, huh, I never noticed that there. Have you ever had moments like that? Maybe you're reading the Bible and you're reading a passage you've read a thousand times. And all of a sudden you're like, I know this story like the back. I, I never saw that before. Where did that come from? Someone just add that to my Bible? What, what in the world? Okay, it's that type of a moment where now she looks up and God's like, see. It's like he intervened through the hurt, through the sorrow, through the selfishness, through all the blockade that she has been setting up. And God breaks them down just enough that she looks, her eyes are open, and she saw what? A well of water that was probably there the whole time. And she was given up. How often is it that when we feel like we want to give up, the solution to our problems was right there the whole time? We just didn't see it, didn't want to see it, didn't care to see it, didn't want to have the humility to go and try to see it, didn't want to ask for help, didn't want to ask for assistance, didn't want to pick up that phone and make a call, didn't want to try to do whatever it would take because we were afraid, because we were prideful, because we were selfish or whatever it is, our eyes are closed to the help that's available and we don't pick up that phone and call. We've been there. God opens her eyes and she saw the well that's there. So she went and filled the water skin and gave the boy a drink. And God was with the boy and he grew and settled in the wilderness. It became an archer. Kind of ironic. He became an archer and she sat a bow shot away. I find that ironic. <laughs> Sense of humor of mine. And he settled in the wilderness of Paran and his mother got his wife for him from the land of Egypt. Makes sense. That's where she's from. See, I know the perfect hottie for you. <laughs> I know so-and-so, and they had a kid, and they were a hottie, and so their kids are probably hotties, so they're going to be just right for you. <laughs> Here's what just is happening here. She just didn't remember the will of God in her life. It was a mystery to her. She didn't know what God was doing. That's this whole section here, this mystery of the will of God. Sarah didn't believe that God had a plan, that God would do something. Hagar wasn't seeing God intervene in the way that she approached, appreciated. It's just this whole mystery about this will of God that they just have a hard time figuring out, God, what's your plan? What do you want? What are you expecting? What are you doing? Where do I fit? These are questions I struggle with. You guys struggle with these? You know, I, mean, I hear people every now and then, I'll be on like different chat rooms or Facebook uh, uh, group pages, and I'll be talking about things, and I'm inviting people to the live stream, and I'm trying to talk to them about Christ a little bit, and every now and then someone will say, well, what's God's will for my life? I hear that one a lot. 
And don't think that's a question the kids ask and youths ask. I've had adults ask. Just trying to figure out what is this? What is God doing? What is going on? And so I thought the best way to help answer that question with this text is to deal with how Paul interpreted this text. We already mentioned it. Where was it? Galatians chapter 4. So uh, on a rare move on my part, usually I stay in a single passage and don't go bouncing around, but given that Paul interpreted Genesis chapter 21, uh, uh, I figured maybe we ought to look at his interpretation. (laughs) It would seem wise given that God used him to write scripture. And so uh, chapter 4, Four of Galatians, starting around verse 21, is where we're going to be at. Now, real quick, here, here's the thing. Uh, just a side note for you. We are going to have a Galatians quiz coming up. Here's why. Someone said you're getting tested in a few weeks on Galatians. You are. Uh, here's what happens. The Southern Baptist Association uh, hands out uh, two studies a year that are in-depth studies, like a January Bible study series and uh, another type of study in toward the summer, fall area. And so those are the studies that they send out. And the January Bible study series came out right after we finished the book of Galatians. And the study was... Galatians. And it was like, great, we can either have everybody show up on a couple of days and we'll spend six hours going through what we just covered, or we'll give an exam. And anybody that does well on the test, uh, that passes the test with 70% or better, will be able to get credit for having taken the course, and we don't have to redo it. So that's what we're going to be doing. So that's why we've been having Galatian facts on your handout uh, each week, although this week there isn't one because... We're covering a big section of it again. So this will be a reminder for some, possibly new for the rest of you who haven't been through Galatians. So Galatians chapter 4, this is Paul writing a letter to the region of Galatia. It's like writing a letter to the the south, okay? It's saying to the south. That means send it to Mississippi, then over to Texas, and, and on over to maybe up to Kentucky. And it's the southern region. So this is the Galatian region. And so that it's not like Galatia is like a city. It's a region of lots of cities within it. So that's what Paul's writing. And he's very urgent on this issue. Paul is ex- uh, just passionate about the churches that he planted throughout that region. They are leaving the, the doctrine of Jesus only for salvation. And they're adding to it, saying, we want, yeah, Jesus to forgive you of your sins. But if you're not circumcised, then you're not saved. That's how some churches treat. If you're not a member of a certain church, you're not saved. Or if you're not baptized, you're not saved. Or if you don't dress right, you're not saved. That type of an attitude that we've done uh, uh, throughout our societies within the church, unfortunately, because salvation is Jesus only. That's it. And so Paul tries to uh, pull an analogy using Hagar and Sarah. Uh, Paul believes and knows that Hagar and Sarah were real people. It's kind of neat when the Old New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Like when they're quoting Genesis. I mean, think about that. They believe Genesis is a real, real event that have happened. They don't believe it was myth. They don't believe it was fake. They don't believe it was all symbolism and allegorical. Uh, they believe it was real people, real events, just like Jesus did. He quoted from Genesis as real people. Adam and Eve were real people. And, and so it's just neat to see that develop. Uh, So Paul's writing, and he says in chapter 4, verse 21, Tell me, those of you who want to be under the law, you want to be circumcised to be saved, you want that law on you, don't you hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave, that would be Hagar, okay, Ishmael through Hagar, so one son by a slave, and the other by a free woman. Sarah was not a slave. Hagar, slave. Sarah, not a slave which means she is free. You got that? Hagar, Sarah, slave, free. Okay, I'm pointing this out to, because this is a big part of Paul's uh, allegory he's going to build here based on these historical people. Where, uh, so he had one by the slave, one other by a free woman, verse 23. But the one by the slave was born according to the impulse of the flesh... Okay, the one that by the slave, that means that there was an impulse, they were impatient, they didn't want to wait for God's timing, and they just did something that was basically natural, if you will. Okay, sinfully natural. So uh, uh, that was impulse of the flesh, while one by the free woman was born as a result of a promise. Okay, so Ishmael is a result of just a drunken night. You know, maybe it was Memphis. 
Maybe it was hot southern nights. <laughs> Okay, that, that was Ishmael's birth and conception, but Isaac was like a miracle child. Okay, Isaac was unique. He was, he was still naturally born, but there was a child of promise there. It was something unique about Isaac. Yes, he was born like Ishmael was born, but this is a blessing of God in a special way. It's unique. Something's unique about Isaac. He's a child of promise. Verse 24. These things are illustrations. That's what he's going to say. I'm going to make an illustration using these things. Okay, here's these people. They're historical people. They're real people. You know these people. We know the law. We know all that's there. But I'm going to go ahead and use them as an illustration. I want to speak allegorically now. I'm going to speak using some, maybe some symbolism, if you will. I know I'm messing up the terminologies, but you know, bear with us. That's what Paul's doing here. He said, I'm just going to make an illustration using these people here. So, here's an illustration for you. For the women, now let's say they represent two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai and bears children into slavery. This is Hagar. Okay, so Hagar, um, she's a slave woman, and her child was an issue of sin and impulse of the flesh, natural born. That's like Mount Sinai, where Moses went up and got the law. Okay, that's that person there. She represents that, let's say. Now, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds, here in verse 25, to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother, for it is written, Rejoice, childless woman, who does not give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor, for the children of the desolate are many, more numerous than those of the woman who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. In other words, here's something that's special. She was barren, and she gets to shout for joy because nations are going to come from her. Because now, because Isaac is a child of promise. Okay, so he's, so that's where, where Paul's going with this. But just as then the child born according to the flesh persecuted the one born according to the spirit, so also now. But what do the scriptures say? Drive out the slave and her son, for the son of the, of the slave will never be a co-heir with the son of the free woman. Therefore, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. Now, Paul talks in very unique words here and get a little complicated. Let me boil this down to you. When you are born, you are born as a slave to sin. Okay? Everyone that's born are natural born sinners. Okay? If I were to remake that movie, that's what I would title it. Natural born sinners rather than natural born killers. Okay? Natural born sinners. That's what we all are. We're all slaves to sin. Now, I've had one person say, I'm not a slave to sin. You're wrong. Okay. Um... Be perfect then. If you're not a slave to sin, be perfect. Well, I can't be perfect. Why not? Because you're a slave to sin. And that's when I go doy. And we don't have enough doy moments in the world. (laughs) Okay? We were slaves to sin. Every single one of us are slaves or like Ishmael. Okay? We are children of slavery. We are naturally born children of slavery. Now, when Jesus enters into the picture and you turn to Jesus and you say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. Wash me. Cleanse me. I want a relationship with you. Forgive me. And you make Jesus Lord and Savior of your life. You are what is called being born again. Now, with this new birth, it's not a natural birth like you had with your parents. Being born again means there's a new birth, a birth of promise. What's that birth of promise? That God would forgive all sins for those who call upon the name of the Lord. And that you become like Isaac, a child of promise. Not the old creation, but a new creation. Not like Ishmael, slave to sin, but now like Isaac, a free person where the bondages of sins have been broken because of the cross of Christ. Okay, so when people start telling, asking me, 
What is God's will for my life? I start with Jesus. That's where I start. I start with the cross. His will is that you won't perish, but have everlasting life. That your sins will be forgiven. And then someone says, well, okay, I am a Christian. I've accepted Jesus as my Savior. I'm there. I'm like Isaac. I'm a child of promise. Now what? Start living like a child of promise. What's God's will for Isaac's life? It's generic. Have kids and obey God. That's that's, that's God's will for Isaac as, as a whole. It's very generic. Follow God. Live like a child of promise. Start serving, worshiping, and being obedient. And what people want is they want God's will to be so knitted so much that they will want God to say, I want you to apply at this job. I want you to work there for so many years. I want you to quit that job and come over here. You're going to buy that house. You're going to go to that school. You're going to marry that person. And you're going to, and that's what they want. They want their life spilled out for them where there's really no act of faith anywhere. It's almost as if people who say, what's God's will in my life? They're asking God, treat me like a robot and design everything for me in a way that I don't have to make any choices. That's what they're asking for. They want choices removed from their life. And that is not God's will. He wills that you would make choices. And he wants you to make those choices to be obedient consistent with his word and as a way that honors him. That's what he wants. God, I have this child and they're screaming. What's your will? Love them. Serve them. Be there for them. But I'm running out of strength. Rely on me for your strength. Lord, I'm at this job. What's your will? Work with integrity. Be respectful to your boss and don't micromanage. Be honest. Be loyal. Be above, repro- be, a, be above the appearance of evil. That's what God, that's what his word teaches. You know, so God, what's your will? It's there. It's almost like God can say, God, what's your will for my life? And he says, well, haven't you read this lately? I mean, is this not enough? Have you tried reading it cover to cover? How long does that take? That's my will. It's there. Be holy. As God is holy. That's that's what he wants. And that's what we can look at here is that we have this moment of, if you have accepted Christ, you're a child of promise. So I want to throw that out to you. Are you a child of promise? Are you simply just a child like Ishmael or are you like Isaac? Are you still in bondage and slave to sin or have you been set free by the blood of Christ? Which has it been? And if you've been set free and you're a child of promise, then start acting like it. Start living like it. Let people see that freedom. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray.